Well, good morning to all of you. I greet you in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope. And it's, uh, I want to thank uh, Tommy Ice and Tim LaHaye for inviting me to make this particular presentation. And I must tell you right up front that I feel a little uh, like a fish out of water here because I am an evangelist. And as such, I preach all the time and preach with great passion. So delivering an academic type paper is not exactly my cup of tea. But uh, we'll see how it goes this morning. Incidentally, Tim, when you were making your comments a few minutes ago, it reminded me of an incident that happened to me a few months ago. I was in Rockford, Illinois, uh, in a conference with Erwin um, Lutzer. And uh, I went up to Pastor Lutzer and I said, I was reading about your family recently, and I read where your father is 104 years old and your mother is 103. I said, Is that right? And he said, That's correct. He said, That was true at the time that was written. He said, My father, however, died about six months ago. But said, you know what he told me right before he died? I said, no. He said, well, son, your mom and I were talking the other night, and I said to her, you know, by now, I'm convinced that all of our friends in heaven have decided that we went to hell. <laughs> <laughs> so hang in there, Tim. <laughs> I also want to express thanks this morning to... Um, and those who so graciously read this manuscript and offered suggestions on it, and that included uh, Sean Osborne and Bill Solace and Nathan Jones and Lambert Dolphin and Damon Duck. I read that list to my wife the other day, and she said, no, wait a minute. Are you telling me that you submitted this manuscript to a dolphin and a duck? And I said, well, yes, I, I did. You know, Damon Duck has a great sense of humor. He writes uh, Bible prophecy books that really have a tremendous uh, sense of humor about them, and he has a great sense of humor about his name. And he told me recently that he was asked to speak at a church, hold a Bible prophecy conference at a church, and they decided to really advertise it. So they ran big display ads in the local paper, and the headline at the top of the ad said, have you ever heard a duck talk? And it really caught the attention of people, and they had a good turnout. <laughs> I think I would go. I'd like to acknowledge two special guests who are here with me this morning. One is my wife, Ann. She said if I were to ask her to stand that uh, I would be dead meat, so I'm not going to ask her to stand. But uh, uh, next to her is another special guest, and that is a wonderful uh, man from the Philippine Islands that we have been helping support for many years. And we brought him over here this year for this conference. His name is Remigio Blanco. He is a pastor, he is an evangelist, he is a teacher of Bible prophecy. He holds conferences all over the Philippines primarily for pastors to try to teach them Bible prophecy. And I'd like for you to welcome him. Pastor Blanco, would you stand please? There you go. For those of you who know the Philippines, he's from Pangasinan province, which is just north of Manila. Now, my ministry has a display table. Uh, out in the uh, lobby, and uh, on it you will find some free copies of our magazine that we put out every other month, including the very latest edition uh, in the main article being Satan's Story, Past, Present, and Future. And uh, we also have 100 copies of the third edition of my book about U.S. and Bible prophecy that are free of charge. So first come, first serve, you might want to pick one of those up after this particular session. Before I get into my assigned topic, I'd like to share a few chuckles with you by showing you a few church signs. The first three show how tough it is to be a pastor. Come here, our pastor. He's not very good, but he's short. <laughs> now is a good time to visit. Our pastor is on vacation. <laughs> Do you know what hell is? Come here, our pastor. And now, three new church titles. These are my favorites, and I've got a whole bunch of them, but these are three new ones I just added. How about the Boring United Methodist Church? <laughs> I've been to a few of those. How about the IHOP Church? Or the First Congregational Meth Church? <laughs> Imagine they have quite a subculture attending that one. And then the latest one that I just added to the collection, just a funny message on a church sign, Honk if you love Jesus, text while driving if you want to meet Him. <laughs> a lot of truth in that. Well, I want to talk with you uh, this morning about an evaluation of the Muslim Antichrist theory. That was the topic that was assigned to me. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you so much for raising up this organization some 30 years ago. I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, that um, you have blessed it so mightily over the years. I thank you for the growth that it's seen. I pray that you will be with all the speakers throughout this conference. Anoint each one with your Holy Spirit. May all of us come to a better understanding of your prophetic word. But most of all, may all of us be drawn into a closer and deeper relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. The question as to whether or not the Antichrist will be a Jew or a Gentile has been hotly debated by Bible prophecy experts ever since the revival of the study of end time Bible prophecy some 400 years ago. In recent years the debate has taken on a new flavor by some who are obviously impressed with the resurgence of Islam worldwide. They have developed a whole new scheme of end time events in which one of the most prominent features is a Muslim Antichrist. For those of you who are interested in pursuing this topic in greater detail, I would recommend that you consult two books and a website. The website is thebeastfromtheeast.org. You'll find many, many articles there, beastfromtheeast.org. And the two books are Antichrist, Islam's Awaited Messiah by Joel Richardson, and God's War on Terror, subtitle Islam, Prophecy, and the Bible by Valid Shubat with Joel Richardson. Now Richardson's book, which was published in 2006, is considered to be the cornerstone of the whole movement. It was picked up by World Net Daily, Joseph Farrar's organization, and republished by them in 2009 under the title The Islamic Antichrist. It's the same book, exactly, but it's just a different title. The book features ten endorsements by various pastors, professors, and heads of ministries. Not a one is a Bible prophecy teacher or a recognized expert on Bible prophecy. Joel Richardson is an excellent writer who knows how to make a persuasive argument, particularly if the reader knows nothing at all about Bible prophecy. Valid Shubat's book is more detailed, it's much longer, 516 pages compared to Richardson's 276 pages. As most of you know, Valid Shubat is an outstanding speaker on the topic of Islamic terrorism. But he is not a writer. His writing is very tedious, it's very difficult to follow. Even worse, the organizational format of the book is chaotic and confusing. I can say without hesitation that his book is one of the most difficult ones I've ever tried to wade through in my lifetime of reading. To me it was like trying to read and make sense out of the Quran. Although most of you are familiar with Valid, for those of you who are not, let me point out that he claims to be a former Palestinian terrorist. I doubt that few, if any of you, know anything about Joel Richardson. And it is difficult to find out anything about him because that is not his real name. He reveals that fact in the introduction of his book and then states that he uses a pen name due to fear of Muslim threats on his life. That revelation really turned me off because I believe that people who speak out publicly on political, social, or theological issues should be willing to put their name to their words. It is one thing to use a pen name in writing fiction. It is another to resort to a pseudonym when writing nonfiction. That prevents the reader from being able to evaluate the credentials of the writer. After reading Joel's book, I contacted him by email and told him that I saw no validity to his reason for refusing to divulge his true identity. I pointed out that I had found a website of his on the internet, and that on that site he provides his speaking schedule. I said to him, if someone wants to kill you, all they have to do is go to one of your speaking engagements and shoot you. That prompted him to give me a call. He, <laughs> he said it was not so much his life he was trying to protect as it was the lives of his family members. I told him I still could not understand his hesitancy in revealing his true identity. I pointed out that I have written extensively on Islam, that I have posted the articles on the internet, and that I have made statements far more inflammatory than anything I had read in his book. But he asked, has your life been threatened? And I told him no, and he said, well, mine has been. Then, for some unknown reason, he suddenly told me his real name and asked me to keep it a secret. I took advantage of his call to ask him a question that had puzzled me ever since I had read Valid Shubat's book. I said, Joel, you are an outstanding writer. Shubat's book is very poorly written, yet your name is on the cover. What was your contribution to the book? Did you just do the research? Joel responded by saying that he had written nearly all of the book, but that when he got the manuscript back from Valid, it looked like it had been put through a blender. 
He said he tried to repair the damage, but again it was returned in a disheveled state. He said that at that point he just gave up. He then added that Valid has now hired a professional editor to try to salvage the book. Before I review the rather bizarre theories about the end times that are contained in these books, I think it would be wise to present some background material about Islam. I realize that many of you are very well informed when it comes to Islam, but I found out something else too. And that is that often people who are very well informed about Islam know almost nothing about Islamic eschatology. As all of you know, the holiest book of Islam is the Quran, which supposedly contains statements of the Islamic God Allah, which were given by his prophet Muhammad uh, through the angel Gabriel. Now Muhammad was illiterate, so scribes wrote down what he said over a 23 year period of time until his death in 632 AD. Much of the content of the Quran was delivered to Muhammad while he was experiencing seizures that even his first wife considered to be demonic in nature. The scribes began compiling the Quran while he was alive, shortly before his death. The Quran is about the length of the New Testament. The second most sacred book of Islam is called the Hadith. It is mainly a collection of Muhammad's sayings that were not considered to be revelations directly from Allah. The Hadith also contains stories about things Muhammad did. I think it is very important to note that the Hadith was compiled in the 9th century, about 200 years after the death of Muhammad. There were several compilations made during that time, but the most authoritative is considered to be the one by al-Bukhari. He collected a total of over 400,000 sayings of Muhammad and stories about him. These came from the writings of both friends and family members. In fact, most of them came from Muhammad's 15 wives. Al-Bukhari verified 7,000 as genuine. How he did that, I have no idea. These became the Al-Bukhari Hadith, one of several versions of the Hadith that have been produced by compilers. Strangely, the Quran contains very little prophecy. In fact, almost no prophecy at all. It mainly affirms that history will consummate in what's called the hour. This is when the resurrection and judgment will take place. So the Hadith containing hearsay statements, uh, hearsay statements from Muhammad is the major source of Islamic eschatology. It's extremely difficult to piece together the Islamic concept of the end times. The information is greatly disjointed, being spread throughout the Hadith, and unlike Christian prophecy scholars, Islamic students of prophecy have never attempted to systematize the concepts into charts and diagrams, which show all the, how all the events relate to one another. The most helpful source that I was able to discover was a book by Dr. Samuel Shahid called The Last Trumpet. He attempts to show that the major concepts of Islamic eschatology were borrowed from the Hebrew Scriptures, from the Christian New Testament, and from Zoroastrianism. The author is the Director of Islamic Studies at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth. Now Dr. Shahid proves conclusively that Muhammad secured most of his ideas orally from Christians, Jews, and from followers of Zoroastrianism. In the process, he got many of the stories and the principles confused, as you well know. For example, the Hadith states that the mother of Jesus was Mary, the sister of Moses. Dr. Shahid also points out that the Hadith was compiled at a time when Islamic authorities knew much more about the Bible and Christian traditions and literature. Thus, many Hadith passages were manufactured and embellished and were heavily influenced by Christian sources. Complicating matters is the fact that Hadith passages concerning the end times are highly contradictory, and thus it is difficult to nail down a lot of specifics. Only a general outline of end time events can be given. One very interesting aspect of Islamic eschatology is that it presents signs of the times for people to watch for. Like Christianity, Islam teaches that only God knows the exact timing of end time events. But there are signs to watch for that will indicate the season of the end times, and these signs fall into two categories, major and minor. Most of the minor signs have to do with general trends of society. The major signs refer to specific prophesied events that will occur between the time of the appearance of the Antichrist and the hour of resurrection and judgment. The listings of both the minor and major signs vary greatly. Let me give you some examples of minor signs, and as I do so you will see how they are like the signs prophesied in the Bible 
and most obviously borrowed from the Bible. Minor signs. An increase in ignorance concerning the fundamentals of the faith. Increasing instability of the faith as Muslims become Christians overnight. An increase in false prophets. An increase in apostasy as evidenced by Muslims uh, following false teachers. An increase in religious pretentiousness as in the building of luxurious mosques. An acceptance of astrology. An increase in alcohol use and illicit sexual relations. An increase in natural calamities. An increase in political corruption. People longing for death due to an increase in calamities and wickedness. Increasing paganism. Muslims increasingly following non-Muslim lifestyles. An increase in war and civil wars even among Muslims. There are many, many other minor signs that are peculiar to Islam that were not borrowed from the New Testament, most of which are fantastical in nature. Here are some examples. Women will outnumber men 50 to 1 in the end times. No reason is given for this, although many Islamic scholars believe it's because uh, they assume that the men will be killed off as jihad martyrs in the end times. The Arabs must conquer Constantinople in the end times. The city now called Istanbul was conquered by Muslims in the 15th century, but not by Arabs. A people will emerge who will eat with their tongues like cows. Time will contract with a year being like a month and a month like a week. Wild beasts will speak to men, and the Euphrates River will uncover a mountain of gold. And that's only a few of the many, many rather fantastic ones. Now, the major signs pointing to the hour are all critical events that are part of the end time sequence of events beginning with the appearance of the Antichrist. I've never read a sequence of events that did not begin with the appearance of the Antichrist. Muslim scholars generally do not try to present a strict chronological order of what's going to ultimately transpire, but the following order is representative. First, the appearance of the Antichrist called the Dajjal. Second, the rising of the Messiah called the Mahdi. Third, the return of Jesus. Fourth, the return of the reign of Jesus. Number five, the day of resurrection called the hour. And number six, the day of judgment. Those are the six major events of end time prophecy according to Islam. There are many other end time events mentioned in the Hadith, but these are the most important. Let's look for a moment at each one of these key events in their chronological order. First, the appearance of the Antichrist called the Dajjal. According to the Hadith, he will be a Jew born in Iran to parents who have been childless for 30 years. He will have only one eye. He will claim to be a prophet, and then he will claim to be divine. He will deceive many by his godliness and his miracles. He will go forth with an army of 70,000 Jews and 70,000 Tartars, and he will conquer all the world except Mecca and Medina. His reign will last for 40 days during a time when one day will be like a year. Some passages of Hadith indicate that he will have the word infidel written on his forehead. His reign is characterized by cruelty and deceit. He has a militaristic mentality. His purpose is to be deified, worshipped, and to reign. The rising of the Islamic Messiah called the Mahdi. He will be a descendant of Muhammad who will come on a white horse. He will deliver the world from the reign of the Dajjal. In the process he will conquer Israel and slaughter all the Jews. He will establish a new Islamic world headquarters in Jerusalem and he will rule for seven years and possibly eight or nine depending upon which Hadith passage you read. His rule will end with his death. Then the return of Jesus. It is not clear at what point in the career of the Mahdi Jesus will return. Some believe it will be as soon as the Mahdi is able to organize his Muslim army to oppose the Jal's Jewish army. Jesus will return to the Mount of Olives and then head to Damascus where He will meet up with the Mahdi and He will submit Himself to the Mahdi as a subordinate. At some point in the Mahdi's war, Jesus Himself will be the one who will kill the Dajjal, the Antichrist, and see to the annihilation of the Jews. Jesus will then serve as an Islamic evangelist, proclaiming Islam as the one and only true religion, and He will establish Islamic Sharia law throughout the entire earth including the state of Oklahoma. <laughs> Sorry about that. The reign of Jesus. Upon the death of the Mahdi, Jesus will assume control of the Islamic worldwide kingdom. 
Jesus will reign for 40 years. He will be a just ruler. Every harmful beast will be domesticated. There will be abundant rain and plentiful harvest. All weapons of war will be converted into tools of agriculture, and there will be worldwide peace. All of this imagery, of course, is taken directly out of the book of Isaiah. Jesus will go to Mecca regularly to perform rituals of pilgrimage. 21 years into His reign, Jesus will marry and beget children. 19 years later, He will die. He will be buried in Medina next to Muhammad, where He will await the day of resurrection like all other humans who have died. The day of resurrection called the hour. There is only one resurrection in Islamic eschatology. The saved and the unsaved are resurrected at the same time. Muhammad will be the first human being to be resurrected. All those resurrected will be naked. Abraham will be the first person to be clothed by Allah. He will be seated facing Allah's throne. Muhammad will then be clothed and will be seated at the right hand of Allah. The day of judgment. At this point, Allah descends from heaven to judge all humanity. Allah will weigh the good and bad deeds of each person. This is called the concept of the scale. The deeds of all people will be weighed in Allah's scale to determine their eternal destiny. Now, with this brief background in Islamic eschatology, let's take a look at the thesis that Richardson presents in his book. He argues that the Mahdi will be the Antichrist of the Bible, and that the Muslim Jesus will be the false prophet of the Bible who serves the Antichrist and his purposes. Both will be destroyed when the true Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation. The true Jesus will be viewed by Muslims as the Dajjal, or the Islamic Antichrist. As proof of his thesis, he points repeatedly over and over again to what he calls amazing similarities and amazing parallels between the Biblical Antichrist and the Muslim Mahdi. He points out that both are pictured as an unparalleled political, military, and religious leader who will come on a white horse, who will team up with a false prophet to conquer the world and institute a one world religion. The Bible says the Antichrist will change the laws and the times. Richardson asserts that the Mahdi will do just that, instituting Sharia law and imposing the Islamic calendar. Likewise, the Bible says the Antichrist will behead those who resist him. And Richardson spends an entire chapter emphasizing that execution by beheading is one of the cardinal characteristics of Islam. Richardson even points out that there is a Hadith passage that states that the Mahdi will make a covenant with the Romans through a Jewish intermediary, and that the covenant will be for a period of seven years, just like the seven-year covenant the Bible says the Antichrist will make with the Jewish people. Now, I personally find nothing startling or surprising about these similarities. As I have already pointed out, Muhammad got most of his ideas concerning the end times from discussions with Christians and Jews. And these ideas were later embellished by his followers, who were even better acquainted with biblical prophecies concerning the end times. Furthermore, the one who inspired Muhammad and his followers, namely Satan, was an expert on Bible prophecy. Nor am I impressed with the similarities that he points out. For example, it is only natural that the Mahdi, like the Antichrist, should be viewed as a great leader who will conquer the world and institute a one world religion. The assertion that the Mahdi will return on a white horse is, of course, borrowed directly from Scripture, as is the idea of a false prophet. As for the laws and the calendar, whoever the Antichrist may be, it is absolutely certain that he will change the laws by instituting a totalitarian system devoid of individual rights. And he will most certainly, whoever he is, change the calendar, because the calendar followed by most of the world dates from the time of Jesus. The point about beheading is flimsy, flimsy evidence at best. Beheading is not a unique characteristic of Islam. It is one of the stellar characteristics, or was one, of the French Revolution, and is just the type of horror the Antichrist would institute regardless of his nationality or his religion. And as for the seven-year covenant the Mahdi makes with the Romans, which Richardson says should be interpreted as Christians, it is not a covenant with the Jewish people, as the Bible prophesies. According to Richardson's end time scenario, the Mahdi and the Muslim Jesus, the false prophet, will unite the Middle Eastern Islamic world, reviving the Ottoman Empire. They will conquer Israel. They will establish the headquarters of the Caliphate in Jerusalem. 
Their rule will come to an end in the battle of Gog and Magog that is portrayed in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which will occur at the end of the tribulation when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And again, when Jesus returns, the Islamic world would view the true Jesus as the Dajjal or the Islamic Antichrist. One glaring problem with this scenario is that Islamic eschatology always teaches that the Dajjal, the Antichrist, will come first, and his appearance will signal that the Mahdi is about to arise. Richardson's scenario puts the appearance of the Islamic Dajjal at the end of the tribulation instead of at the beginning. And so I ask, if some person arrives on the scene claiming to be the Mahdi before the appearance of the Dajjal, why in the world would he be accepted by Muslims when they're looking instead for the appearance of the Dajjal? Nor is it likely that any person, this is an important point, nor is it likely that any person claiming to be the Mahdi would be immediately accepted by the whole Islamic world. The reason is that the concept of the Mahdi is one of the key elements in Islamic eschatology that separates, separates Shiites from Sunnis. The Sunni branch of Islam believes that Muhammad's successor, Abu Bakr, selected in 632, rightfully took the place as the leader of the Muslim world. The Shiites, on the other hand, believe that Muhammad's successor should have been a blood relative and not just a person selected on the basis of Islamic piety or politics. You see, Abu Bakr was not a blood relative of Muhammad. He was Muhammad's father-in-law. The Shiites favored this man, Ali ibn Abi, the prophet's cousin, therefore a blood relative, and son-in-law. Ali ultimately became the fourth successor of Muhammad, reigning from 656 to 661. But after the death of Ali, his heirs were overcome by a military leader named Muawiyah Umayyad, who proceeded to establish the Umayyad dynasty centered in Damascus. Shiites refused to recognize his leadership, since he was not a blood relative of Muhammad. They looked instead to the surviving heirs of Ali for leadership. The bloodline of Muhammad, through Ali, became extinct in 873 A.D., when the last Shiite Imam, Muhammad al-Mahdi, who had no brothers, disappeared within days of inheriting the title at the age of four. The Shiites refused to accept that he had been di died or been killed. Of course they did, because this was the last surviving blood relative. They preferred to believe that he was merely hidden and would one day reappear. This event is referred to as the Great Occultation. Now, the boy was the Shiite Twelfth Iman, and he is the one they expect to return as the Islamic Mahdi. The Sunnis strongly reject this concept, particularly since many Shiites teach that the first thing the Twelfth Imam will do is declare that the Shiite version of Islam is the true Orthodox version. Islamic historian uh, Tony Furnish, uh, Timothy Furnish has summed up the difference between the two groups by observing, I love this, for Shiites, he, the Mahdi, has already been here and will return from hiding. For Sunnis, he has yet to emerge into history. So you have a comeback versus a coming out, if you will. The Mahdi, being heralded by Ahmadinejad, is the 12th Imam. If he were to suddenly appear and be declared the 12th Imam, he would be rejected by Sunnis, and the Sunnis constitute 90% of all the Muslims in the world. So all this idea about ultimate Muslim unity is really an idea that walks on thin ice. Another problem with Muslim unity is that the whole idea is contradictory to one of the promises made by God in His covenant with Ishmael. In that covenant, in which God promised that the descendants of Ishmael would be greatly multiplied and would be given all the land east of Israel, God also stated that the Arab peoples would be like wild donkeys, for they would always be in conflict with each other and everyone else. <laughs> Been true in history. As Jacob Prouch has pointed out in his writings on this subject, this aspect of the covenant with Ishmael has been manifest throughout history to this day through the internecine wars between the Arabs. They fought each other for centuries in pre-Islamic Arabia. Muhammad believed that he could unite them through the advocacy of a monotheistic religion, but he failed. Sunnis and Shiites have hated and warred with each other since the 8th century. Consider the modern-day war between Iran and Iraq and the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait with the intent of conquering all the Middle East. Prash sums up the problem of Arab unity by declaring 
The curse of Genesis prevents Islamic unity from developing a united empire overrunning the West. The greatest Islamic empire was strategically dominated by Ottoman Turks who subjugated the Arab Muslims as serfs and as slaves. There was no unity there. One of the most peculiar aspects of Richardson's end time scenario is his insistence that the Mahdi's revived Ottoman Empire will be a regional one and not a worldwide one is claimed in both Islamic and Biblical prophecy. In both Islamic and Biblical prophecy it claims that the empire of the Antichrist will be a worldwide one. Joel Richardson says no, that's a misinterpretation. It will only be a local one. In order to sustain this totally revisionist interpretation of end time prophecy, Richardson goes to great pains to deny the clear meaning of Revelation 13, 7, which reads, And it was given to him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Let me ask you a question. What would God have to say to convince us that the Antichrist is going to have a worldwide kingdom? I mean, it's just as plain as it can be. Yet Richardson goes to great detail to try to say this does not mean what it says. He starts out by saying, he dismisses the verse as being nothing but hyperbole. He does so incredibly by quoting Daniel 5, verses 18 through 19, where it says, Nebuchadnezzar was feared by all peoples and nations and men of every language. Richardson then asks, Did every single nation on the earth fear Nebuchadnezzar? My answer would be, Yes, all nations that were aware of him. That's all the statement means in its context. Then he uses 1 Kings 4.34 says that men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Joel Richardson sneers rather decisively at this passage and he says, quote, Was Solomon's wisdom so impressive that not a single king in all the earth failed to hear of it? That's not what the verse says. Read it again. It says the kings who had heard of his wisdom sent representatives. Not all the kings, only those who had heard of him. Context determines meaning. And the context of Revelation 13 7 clearly means the Antichrist kingdom will be worldwide and not just a regional coalition of Muslim nations. His attempt to limit the kingdom of the Antichrist to a regional era is reminiscent of the attempt of Genesis revisionists to limit the worldwide flood of Noah to the Middle East. Furthermore, the worldwide nature of the Antichrist kingdom is affirmed in Daniel 7 verse 23 where the prophet states that the Antichrist will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. It's interesting that he never addresses this particular verse. Richardson claimed that the final Gentile empire of the Antichrist will be the revived Ottoman Empire, forces him to deal with Nebuchadnezzar's vision of Gentile kingdoms, recorded in Daniel chapter 2. The traditional interpretation of that vision is that its succession of empires ends with the Roman and that it is the Roman Empire that will be revived in the end times and provide the platform from which the Antichrist will rise. To, accomplish, uh, to accommodate his thesis, Richardson argues that the Roman Empire continued to exist in the form of the Byzantine Empire until 1453 when it fell to the Ottoman Empire. It is therefore, he says, the Ottoman Empire which ceased to exist in 1923 that will be resurrected in the end times and not the Roman Empire. And thus the Antichrist will arise out of a revived Ottoman Empire. Now the first problem with this interpretation is it denies the historical fact that the Roman Empire ceased to exist in 476 with the collapse of Rome. What was left of the empire in the east, which is referred to by modern historians as the Byzantine Empire, was Roman in name only, reminiscent of the Holy Roman Empire that existed in Germanic areas of Europe from 800 to 1806. A political entity that Voltaire characterized as neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Another problem is that Nebuchadnezzar's dream does not provide for the insertion of the Ottoman Empire. The head of gold stood for the Babylonian Empire, the chest of silver for the Medo-Persian Empire, the thighs of bronze for the Greek Empire, the legs of iron for the Roman Empire, the feet of iron mixed with clay represent the final Gentile Empire out of which the Antichrist will rise. The traditional interpretation has been that the feet stand for a revival of the Roman Empire. But if the Ottoman Empire is to be inserted into the picture following the Roman, where is the symbol of it? Do the feet represent both the Ottoman Empire 
and its end time revival, there are just not enough body parts to provide symbols for both the Ottoman Empire and its revival. The same problem occurs when you consider Revelation 17, verses 10 through 11. In that passage, the Apostle John is told that there are seven kings or empires to be considered in world history, and that the final one will become an eighth, the kingdom of the Antichrist. Here's how it's put. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when it comes, it must remain for a little while. And the beast which was and is not is himself an eighth, and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. Now, at that point in history, the five fallen would have been Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. The one existing would have been the Roman Empire. The one to come would be the revived Roman Empire. And the eighth and final empire would be the worldwide empire of the Antichrist. Here's the problem. If you insert the Ottoman Empire into this list, where does it fit? If it is the seventh, then its revival would be the eighth, and there is no place left for the final worldwide empire of the Antichrist. I suspect that this is the reason that Richardson insists that the revival of the Ottoman Empire will be the final empire out of which the Antichrist will arise, and it will not develop into a worldwide empire as both Islamic and biblical prophecies specify. There are just not enough empires mentioned in Revelation 17 to include the Ottoman Empire, its resurrection, and its evolution into the final worldwide empire of the Antichrist. Another problem with Richardson's Ottoman Empire thesis is that he completely, this is unbelievable, he completely ignores the prophecy in Daniel 9, 26 that says the Antichrist will arise out of the people who will destroy the Jewish temple. Can you believe that? A whole book on this, and he doesn't even mention this verse. It was the Romans who destroyed the temple in 70 A.D., and it's from the Romans that the Antichrist will, must arise. To me, it's just incredible that Richardson would totally ignore this prophecy. The final problem with Richardson's thesis that I would like to mention concerns his interpretation of the war of Gog and Magog that's pictured in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Richardson denies that the war described in Ezekiel 38 and 39 will be led by Russia or that Russia will even have a part in it. Of course, he has to take this position since he argues that the invading force will be the revived Ottoman Empire and Russia was never a part of it. He says the only reason, listen to this, the only reason people have ever included Russia as part of the invading armies is because Ezekiel says the invasion will be led by the prince of Rosh, and that word Rosh sounds like Russia. This assertion is, of course, patently false. Many, many authors over the years, including modern-day ones like Mark Hitchcock and Ron Rhodes, have gone to great pains to present historical evidence that identifies Russia uh, with uh, this particular passage. The passage in question, Ezekiel 38.2, says, the invasion will be led by Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And I think it's important to note that both Josephus in the first century and Jerome in the fifth century identified Magog with the Scythian tribes in Russia. Richardson favors Turkey as the leader of the coalition. Yet Ezekiel 38 clearly states that the invasion will be led by the prince of Rosh coming from the remote parts of the north or the uttermost parts of the north. There is no way that Turkey could be considered a nation located in the remote parts of the north. Again, this is a verse that Richardson completely ignores in his writing. Richardson never reveals when he believes the Ezekiel 38 invasion of Israel will occur, but it must be at the end of the tribulation since the invading army will be the army of the Mahdi and will be destroyed by God. Thus, he must equate the battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 with the battle of Armageddon. But these are not the same battles. The battle of Gog and Magog involves Russia and certain specified allies who come against Israel either at the beginning of the tribulation or most likely before it begins. One of the tip-offs as to the timing of the invasion is the statement that following the defeat of the invading armies, the Jews will spend seven years burning the leftover weapons. Many have equated this seven years with the tribulation, thus putting the invasion at the start of that period. But we know that in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to turn on the Jews and try to annihilate them, causing them to flee the nation. This will make it impossible for them to continue the burning of weapons during the last half of that terrible period. So I believe, most likely, the battle will occur before the tribulation begins. In contrast, the battle of Armageddon occurs at the end of the tribulation, and there really is no battle at all. The armies of the Antichrist are destroyed in an instant when Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives, and speaks a supernatural word 
causing their flesh to drop from their bodies. In the Gog and Magog battle, the invading armies are destroyed on the mountains of Israel. At Armageddon, they're destroyed in a valley. And they will be destroyed at Gog and Magog by pestilence, hailstones, fire, and brimstone. At Armageddon, by a supernatural word from Jesus. Another difference can be found in the motivation of the war. The war of Gog and Magog results from God putting hooks in the jaws of the invading nations and dragging them down against Israel to capture spoil and seize plunder. In contrast, the armies of the world that will be assembled at Armageddon will be gathered by demon spirits. Another serious problem is that with placing Gog and Magog a war at the end of the tribulation is that Ezekiel 38 says the invasion will occur at a time when Israel is living in peace with unwalled cities. And that will not be the case at the end of the tribulation. The land of Israel will be in absolute chaos at that time. Richardson wraps up his arguments with the observation that the Antichrist must be a Muslim because Islam is the most perfect incarnation of the Antichrist spirit. He makes this assertion because Islam denies the Trinity, rejects Jesus as the Son of God, and repudiates the crucifixion of Jesus, arguing that someone else was killed in his place. I do not agree with this observation. To me, the most perfect incarnation of the Antichrist spirit has always been humanism in all of its various forms. Islam points people toward a God, even though he's a false God. Humanism encourages people to worship man. God is denied, man is exalted, and I believe the rejection of God together with the exaltation of self is the ultimate Antichrist spirit. Richardson concludes his book by dealing what he calls potential problems with my thesis. <laughs> he mentions only two. The first is the fact that the Bible states that in the middle of the tribulation when the Antichrist goes to Jerusalem and desecrates the temple, he will declare himself to be God. Richardson says this is possibly the strongest argument that can be made against his thesis, since it is inconceivable that any Muslim would ever claim to be God. And all I can say to that is amen. Nonetheless, he argues that the Muslim Antichrist will become so self-absorbed that he will do this, and he claims that when it happens, the Muslims of the world will be too embarrassed to confess that they have been deceived. I'm sorry, but I find this very hard to believe. To me, that is like saying that the Muslims would be willing to agree that night is day and day is night. There is a limit to deception, and a person would have to cease to be a Muslim in order to believe that any man could be God. I believe the bizarre behavior of the Antichrist described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where it states that he will proclaim himself to be God, rules out any possibility that the Antichrist might prove to be a Muslim. An equally important uh, fact is that I think rule, uh, that rules out the possibility of a Muslim Antichrist is that prophecy states the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel that will guarantee the nation's security. I think it's preposterous to believe that Israel would ever trust its security to a Muslim leader, or that a Muslim leader would be interested in guaranteeing the safety of Israel. The second problem Richardson anticipates relates to his scrambling of the Islamic order of end time events by placing the appearance of the Islamic Dajjal at the end of the tribulation instead of at the beginning. Incredibly, he says, that the Muslims will simply overlook this problem due to the inconsistency of Hadith traditions. As he puts it, once the Mahdi has conquered Israel and taken Jerusalem, the Muslim will accept him regardless of the fact that the Dajjal was supposed to come first. But again, this overlooks the fact that according to Bible prophecy, the first thing the Antichrist will do is make a peace treaty with Israel, not defeat Israel. And I would contend that any Muslim leader who would make peace with Israel would be rejected by the Muslim world, just as was the case with Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, when he signed a treaty with Israel and was assassinated immediately by Islamic fundamentalists. There are other serious problems with Richardson's thesis that he does not acknowledge. How, for example, does he explain the miraculous resurrection of the Roman Empire in the form of the European Union? It's a development that prophecy experts have been telling us to watch for, and those alerts go back several hundred years. Is the revival of the Roman Empire just an accident of history? I think not. I believe that just as the Bible prophesies, it's going to serve as the platform for the ascension of the Antichrist. Another problem Richardson must deal with is the worldwide destruction that Revelation describes in chapters 6 through 9. Those chapters reveal that one half of the world's population is going to die during the first half of the tribulation. Is this going to happen as a result of a regional conflict, or is it just more biblical hyperbole? 
When I finished reading Richardson's book, I found myself wanting to ask him two questions. First, the first one I wanted to ask is, what is he going to do with Psalm 83? This psalm portrays an attack on Israel by a Muslim coalition consisting of Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, Gaza, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. The Bible clearly teaches that God will protect Israel against all such attacks in the end times. The outcome of this war is most likely given in Zephaniah 2. These verses indicate that the attacking nations will be devastated by Israel. It is during this war that Damascus, the capital of Syria, will probably be destroyed completely, never to be rebuilt again. That is why most, most likely why Syria is not mentioned in Ezekiel 38 as one of the Russian allies. The outcome of Psalm 83 is what will most likely produce peace for Israel, the peace that is prophesied to be enjoying when Russia and its allies decide to launch the Ezekiel 38 invasion. The war of Psalm 83, followed by the Ezekiel 38 war, will result in the annihilation of all the armies of the Muslim nations of the Middle East. And these wars are most likely going to occur before the tribulation begins. Thus, if the Antichrist is a Muslim who's going to rule a Muslim empire in the Middle East during the tribulation, he's going to rule over an empire that has been reduced to ashes. The second question that I would like to ask Richardson that he leaves hanging relates to the timing of the rapture. He never once mentions the event in his book, leaving the clear impression that he identifies the rapture with the second coming of Jesus. Now, the book published in 2008 by Valid Shubat with the aid of Joel Richardson adds very little to the debate, but it does clarify some issues. With regard to the rapture, Shubat dismisses it out of hand as being of no importance. That's his words, of no importance. Specifically, he writes, whether the rapture is pre-tribulation, mid, or post-tribulation is totally irrelevant. He then adds, I do pray for a pre-trib rapture and always prepare for a post, but I am of neither position. Regarding the timing of the war of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Shubat confirms that he and Richardson believe it will occur at the end of the tribulation and that it is in fact the same as the Battle of Armageddon. The meaning of Psalm 83 is specifically addressed. Shubat attempts to prove that the war described in this psalm between Israel and its adjacent Arab nations is one that will occur at the end of the tribulation, after the second coming of the Messiah. In other words, it will be part of the Armageddon campaign that will include the Battle of Gog and Magog. Thus he argues that it would be a conflict between forces led by Jesus and those led by the Mahdi. I was astonished to read this interpretation of Psalm 83 because I've studied this psalm in detail and there is not one verse in it that even implies that Jesus will be present on the earth when these events occur. So I looked for Shubat's scriptural proof of Jesus' presence. Believe it or not, the proof he provided was quotes from two other psalms. Psalm 82, 8, Arise, O God, and judge the earth. Psalm 80, 14, Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Neither one of these psalms are related to Psalm 83. Both are prayers by Asaph for the Lord to return to the earth and to bring justice. Neither one states that the Messiah is on the earth. This kind of incredibly sloppy proof texting can be found throughout Shubat's book. Whenever he wants to make a point, he goes fishing for a verse. When he finds it, he reels it in, applies it to the one issue under consideration, where it's re whether it's related to that issue or not. Another example can be found in the second argument he gives for placing Psalm 83 war at the end of the tribulation. He says it must occur at, a time, at that time because it is a war triggered by the Antichrist's desecration of the Jewish temple, a temple that will be rebuilt during the first half of the tribulation. And what is his evidence? He quotes Psalm 79, 1. O God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. Once again, he tries to prove a point about Psalm 83 by quoting a verse from an unrelated psalm that is most likely describing the destruction of Solomon's temple. Shudot Rot displays some torturous logic throughout his book. A good example can be found in his attempt to explain away the meaning of Daniel 9.26. At least he tries to do this. I guess Joel Richardson realized they had to deal with it. This was the passage that Richardson ignored in his book. The plain sense meaning of this passage is that the Antichrist will come from the people who destroy the temple. Shubat tries to dispel this meaning by arguing that the Roman legions that carried out the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 A.D. were composed mainly of Syrians and Turks. He therefore concludes that the Antichrist will arise from the Syrians or Turks and that he will be a Muslim. On the contrary, Bible prophecy scholar Sean Osborne has proved that the Roman legions were composed of Roman soldiers 
recruited from what is present-day Italy and were led by Roman officers of historical renown. Local Syrians and Arabs were recruited as auxiliaries to take care of menial tasks and had at best logistical support roles. Quote, they were in no conceivable manner representative of the people of the prince who shall come. But Shubat's argument is really, uh, 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 here is really grasping at straws in the wind. For one thing, the ethnicity of the soldiers is irrelevant because the Romans never used mercenaries. All their soldiers were citizens of Rome. But it would not have made any difference. Here's the major point I want to make. It would not have made any difference if the legions had been composed of Australian Aborigines. For it was the Roman government that decided to destroy Israel. It was the Roman government that gave the orders. And it was Roman generals who carried out the destruction. Rome was the rod of God's judgment. And it is from the Roman people that the Antichrist will arise. At times, Shubat gets absolutely weird. For example, he says that one day while he was examining the Codex Vaticanus Greek text of the book of Revelation, he noticed, quote, that the supposed Greek letters that are used to translate to the number 666 very much resemble the most common creed of Islam written in Arabic. Here are the letters, here, are the, they, are, here they are in lowercase, and here is the condensed creed reading from right to left. He says it reads, In the name of Allah, followed by the symbol of crossed swords. He then observes that the Greek text for 666 in the Codex Vaticanus looks very similar to this creed, except that the word Allah is presented vertically with the crossed swords to the left of it. He then asks, Is it possible? that the Apostle John, while receiving his divine revelation, did not see Greek letters, but instead was supernaturally shown Arabic words and an Islamic symbol that he then faithfully recorded. You know, I, I, I'd hate to be sarcastic, but at this point I think the only thing appropriate would be the playing of the theme, The Twilight Zone. <laughs> while I was working on this presentation, Joel Richardson came out with a new explanation of Daniel 9.26, undoubtedly in response to the withering criticism that the previous explanation had received. He begins his new interpretation by pointing out that the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus in 70 A.D. did not fall within the 483 years of Daniel's 490-year prophecy. Rather, it occurred 40 years after the close of the period. Thus he surmises that the prophecy concerning the temple's destruction most likely points to the last seven years of Daniel's prophecy, the period of the tribulation when he believes the temple will be destroyed by the Mahdi. He admits that the scriptures do not specifically state that the temple will be destroyed during the tribulation, but he says the destruction is implied in Revelation 11, 1 through 2, where it states the Gentiles will, quote, trample on the holy city for 42 months. He also points to Luke 21, 20, where it stated that Jerusalem will experience desolation, but that verse, of course, applies to the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. So Richardson has gone from completely ignoring Daniel 9, 26, to arguing it was not the Romans who destroyed the temple, to now stating that the prophecy probably relates to a future destruction that is yet to occur during the tribulation. I think what we have here is a perfect illustration of a desperate attempt to manipulate both Bible prophecy and Islamic prophecy to conform to preconceived end time scenario. Even a cursory look at Daniel 9.26 reveals that the destruction of the temple that it prophesies occurs after the Messiah has been cut off, that is, after the end of the first 483 years, and before the beginning of the final tribulation period of seven years. Another recent article by Richardson gloats over the internal problems being experienced by the European Union. It was titled, EU collapse, doom for popular Bible prophecies. Richardson observed, many staunch adherents to the Euro-centered end time theory are slowly awakening to the possibility that soon there will not even be a European Union. He goes so far as to compare, now listen, this is in incredible. He goes so far as to compare the prediction of an end time revival of the Roman Empire to the Watchtower's proclamation that Jesus would return in 1975. I found this comparison to be downright ludicrous, considering the fact that Jesus did not return in 1975, but the Roman Empire has been revived as predicted in the form of the European Union. Further, I found this attack to be amusing, because I consider the internal problems of the European Union to be a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. After all, what was the symbol of the revived Roman Empire in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? 
It was the feet mixed of iron and clay. Such a mixture is inherently unstable. And I have always interpreted it to mean that the revived Roman Empire of the end times would be a loose confederation of states before being galvanized into a powerful empire by the Antichrist. Rather than a great Muslim triumph under the leadership of a Muslim Antichrist, I believe the most likely end time scenario for the Muslim world will be one of overwhelming defeat. First, in the regional wars of Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38, and then in the world wars of Revelation 6, 8, and 9. Muslim power in the Middle East will be dealt a terrible blow by the wars of Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38, both of which I think are most likely to occur before the beginning of the tribulation. But the biggest portion of the Muslim world lives outside the Middle East. The largest Muslim nations are today in order Indonesia, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. It is these nations that I believe will offer the strongest resistance to the European Antichrist, and I believe they will be destroyed in the world war the Antichrist will launch, a war that begins as a conventional one in Revelation 6, but which appears to eventually morph into a nuclear one in Revelation 8 and 9, resulting in the destruction of one half of the Earth's population. Overall, I think that Richardson and Shubat are presenting that what they're presenting as a possible end time scenario events is a hodgepodge of ideas drawn from Bible prophecy, Islamic prophecy, and their own rich imaginations. What they present is not true to either Bible prophecy or Islamic prophecy. Let me conclude with two observations. First, beware of long Lone Ranger interpretations of prophecy that are not widely shared. God does not reveal the meaning of prophecy only to a person or two. 2 Peter 1.20 says, No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Private and peculiar interpretations like the recent pre-wrath rapture usually make an initial big splash and then fade quickly when submitted to critical review. Second, I think the rush to identify the Antichrist as a Muslim is a classic example of newspaper exegesis, of reading the news headlines into the Bible rather than letting the Bible speak for itself. It would be good for all of us to keep in mind a comment made by the great Bible teacher Ray Stedman. What determines the future is what God has done in the past and what He has promised to do in the future. So don't look horizontally at current events. Thank you.